Okay, I'm gonna do another lunchbox soapbox, unpopular sports opinion, another video about sports, uh, another video about boxing. I'm gonna pick up from my last video. I talked about uh, Muhammad Ali, um, and I talked about why I'm not a huge fan of Ali and kind of uh, broke down some of the problematic uh, aspects of his uh, personal life and his career. But then I started talking about Joe Frazier, uh, and I thought, well, it'd be worthwhile to actually have a conversation about Frazier. Uh, he's an interesting figure as well. I'll probably be doing several boxing videos. I've been kind of on a boxing kick lately, so I thought some of these videos would be nice to throw down in case other people are interested and might uh, spurn their interest, uh, encourage them to go out and do some research and reading on their own. Um, or just to know some some history of American sports history and, and American cultural history. Um, but Ali and, and Frazier are are their careers are tied together very closely because they're, they're sort of the chief rivals of each other. Uh, they fought each other three times. Um, they are arguably the two best uh, boxers of an era that's arguably the greatest era of heavyweight fighting. Um, there were many great heavyweight fighters um, in this era. Um, when Ali emerges uh, and early in his career, you are sort of the tail end of Floyd Patterson's career and sort of the emergence of Sonny Liston's career. Um, those two characters and their relationship and their fights with Ali as well would be worth um, having a discussion on also. So maybe I'll do that one day. Uh, but then you get, of course, get Ali, you get Frazier, um, you get George Foreman in there, um, you get Ken Norton in there. At the tail end, you get Larry Holmes in there. So there's all these fighters and, then, and several others too that I'm not even mentioning. As I mentioned in my other video, I said I did feel like prime Joe Frazier, um, before he started having all the issues with his eyes, which we'll discuss, was probably better toe-to-toe -to -toe than Ali, in my opinion. Um, but I also mentioned that I'm just more of a fan of Frazier. Um, I like him more as a person, as a human. Um, but also he caters to a, a boxing style that I personally find more interesting. Uh, you know, everyone kind of has their, their thing that they like. And what made Muhammad Ali so devastating, so good, um, and so beloved is he was the first heavyweight fighter who was able to fight uh, at a heavyweight level successfully, but fighting like a middleweight. Uh, in fact, his, his sort of fighting style was patterned largely off of Sugar Ray Robinson, who's arguably the greatest pound for pound fighter we've ever seen. Um, but yeah, you know, picking and jabbing, moving, being flight of foot and, and kind of doing this sort of more defensive style fighting, using his length, uh, keeping distance and, uh, he's using a lot of speed, which is Ali was known for, which was unusual for a man of his size. Um, but as a result of that, while Ali does lose over the course of his career uh, a few times, um, he is able to sustain a long career because he doesn't take as many hits as say someone like Frazier who's more of a brawler. Um, you know, because Frazier was a shorter man and he was a southpaw, um, he essentially worked by getting inside and then he would, he would, you know, hit you with that, that left hook and he would drop his guys. It's kind of more of a knockout artist. Whereas Ali would typically try to box you and outpoint you. You know, he would just throw lots of jabs and jabs and pick away at you and win the point battle. And sometimes if he could break you down, he could also knock you out as well. But Frazier was essentially um, setting himself up for the big, the big left hook. And as a result of that, in order to get in that position as a shorter man, he had to take a lot of hits first um, in order to throw the, the punch he wanted to throw. Um, so he was actually a, a great defensive boxer as well. A lot of people don't give Frazier the same amount of credit for his defensive skills, but it's just a completely almost antithetical style of defensive skills than say Ali, where Ali's, you know, moving away from people, which was actually weird because he was not really doing proper form, but he was so good at it. He could kind of like put his head back and lean back and do all these things you're not supposed to do, but still get away with it. Whereas Frazier was also, you know, sort of covering up and then getting inside and then trying to throw punches that way. Uh, so the, the two men are almost polar opposites in a lot of ways. Um, but as a result of Frazier's fighting style, one is just preferential to me. I, I like the brawlers. I like the guys who get in close and like to throw those heavy hooks. But he took a lot more punches. He had to take punches in order to get the, like, he might have to take two or three punches in order to get the one punch he really wanted to throw. And there's probably no better example of that than when he fights Ali. If you go back and watch those fights, you'll see that Ali pretty much in every fight is going to win the point battle in terms of number of landed punches. But what Frazier's looking to do is uh, something that is something you can do in pro boxing, but not amateur boxing, and which is win by being the fighter who does more damage, okay, and actually inflicts more physical harm. Okay. Uh, in, in amateur boxing, it's a straight point battle. So it doesn't matter if you land a devastating hook, uh, it counts the same as a ticky tack jab, right? So it's sort of one of those things. In pro boxing, the judges have to sort of um, 
prioritize the punches in terms of those that are doing more harm and inflicting more damage. But what that does also is it uh, creates this incredibly subjective element to judging. Uh, you know, all boxing has a subjective element to it. It's very hard to sort of gauge a lot of these things. And this is why so many of the fights are controversial. Um, just for the record, uh, in the three fights they fight, Frazier wins the first one. Um, and he gets a knockout of Ali. And that's probably what gives him the victory in that fight. Um, Ali uh, always claimed he thought he won because he outpointed Frazier, and he probably did. Um, but again, Frazier did much more physical harm and landed a lot more substantial blows. Truthfully, you could kind of say the same thing for the second fight. If you go back and actually watch fight two, uh, I believe Frazier was the more aggressive fighter. Um, I believe he was um, landing more um, devastating punches. But Ali does outpoint them. And the big difference between the second fight and the first fight is, of course, that Frazier never gets a knockdown. Uh, and so the Georgias award it to Ali, and, you know, that's fine. Uh, Frazier has his own opinions about it. He talks about it in his autobiography and uh, basically says the same thing that I just said, which is, you know, he thought he did more uh, damage to Ali, that he landed more substantial blows. But, you know, they, they went with the point battle on that fight probably because they didn't go with the point battle in the first fight. And truthfully, at this point in Ali's career, everyone kind of wants, well, everyone outside the Frazier camp <laughs> wants Ali to win and wants him to keep fighting because he's a huge draw. And at this point, he's the most famous name in the sport and arguably one of the most famous people on the planet. So <laughs> it's good for everyone in boxing for, to keep Ali going. Now, had the judges gone a different way and given that fight to Frazier, let's say, for whatever reason, uh, you know, well, then Ali's career is kind of dead in the water. Because what that would mean is the guy who claims to be the greatest and, you know, all this kind of stuff couldn't even get past, you know, his biggest rival. Um, but what it ends up setting up is, of course, the rubber match, the third fight, which comes some years later. Um, and at that point in time, Frazier's eyes have diminished to such a degree that eventually, at the end of the fight, his trainer, Eddie Futch, has to throw in a towel. Now, what we've since learned about Frazier is that he had eye problems throughout his entire career, uh, apparently had pretty serious cataracts, uh, and that he got through the physical exams by memorizing the eye charts, uh, which another boxer had apparently taught him, who also had eye problems, which is a problem with people who take a lot of punches to the head, um, and could pass his eye uh, exam that way. We don't know how bad the vision issues were throughout his career. Eddie Futch's trainer claims to have not even known about the problems till after the fact. Um, so whether that's true or not, or he's just kind of covering his own, <laughs> covering his own ass, I don't know. But, um, you know, it's interesting because um, pretty much most people agree that Frazier in the third fight is winning the fight to the first part of the fight. As you get to the last couple rounds, he there's a dramatic drop off. And of course we know why. That's because at this point in time, he's clearly impaired visually um, because he's, the swelling on his face and the fact that he's already so visually impaired He's not able to see, and Eddie Futch is the one who f just finds this out. So, because he sees Frazier tailing off at the fight, he basically asks Frazier to kind of look, and he says he can't see anything. He throws a towel, and Frazier's mad about it at the time. He's since forgiven Futch about it and realizes that he just had his own best interest in, in mind. But I think that Frazier was probably um, in his prime without the without the um, eye issues and things like that. Probably eight out of ten times maybe seven out of 10 times, fair judging, all that kind of stuff, could have taken Ali. That's probably controversial, but that's my opinion, okay? But there's some other interesting things about Joe Frazier that I wanna talk about in his relationship with Muhammad Ali. Some of this is known, some of this is not known. Um, but essentially, um, Joe Frazier, unfortunately for him, emerges as this sort of top contender at the same time that Ali is being banned from boxing due to his stance on the war. And so there's this sort of thing where these two guys, who these two, two great fighters of the same era, sort of miss each other. And Ali anticipated that Frazier was gonna be the next big, big thing in boxing. Um, he'd already been tracking him, but what he didn't know was what was gonna happen with his own career, okay? And so um, this creates a really interesting um, a really interesting uh, sort of relationship between these two men that sort of become where they become kind of become frenemies. So I'm going to pause right there and we'll come back in just a minute. And we're going to talk about the frenemy relationship of Muhammad Ali and how this manifests into a very interesting, interesting sports relationship. Okay. So frenemies, unfortunately for Joe Frazier, which is something completely out of his control, when he emerges and takes on uh, basically the mantle as the heavyweight champion of uh, the world, it's the same time that Ali is being banned from boxing. Uh, and the reason why this is unfortunate is because uh, a lot of people still view 
Ali is the true champ. Um, and, and, you know, the, he's not allowed to fight because of his political stance, social political stance. And so a lot of people look at Frazier as kind of a faux fake champion because uh, he hasn't really ever faced Ali. So Frazier, you know, wants to fight Ali because he knows that until he fights Ali and proves he can beat Ali, he's never going to be given the credit that he deserves, rightfully deserves, okay? And of course, Ali wants to fight Frazier because he wants to get back in boxing um, and he knows it's going to be a huge gate and a huge moneymaker. But where this gets interesting is, um, you know, initially they don't know how long this delay is going to be on Ali being able to fight or not fight. And of course it goes on for quite a long time. Uh, and Ali gets to the point where he's struggling financially. Um, he's not really sure what to do. He's going around, he's doing like tours, at campus universities, speaking out against the war and things like this. Um, still trying to stay relevant in the, in the uh, mainstream uh, media. Uh, and what he actually ends up doing one day is showing up at Joe Frazier's gym. And basically challenging him to a fight. Um, and this becomes a series of antics over the next <laughs> several years, really, while, while Ali's in exile, where he's essentially using uh, Joe Frazier's platform as the heavyweight champion of the world to continue to sort of make himself relevant and interesting in the eyes of the media. Uh, now, it seems that initially Frazier's okay with this, and the, and the two kind of end up forming uh, a friendship. Uh, if you read Ali's um, autobiography, which we're going to come back to in a minute, because that's going to be an interesting little story as well. Uh, he has a, a scene, a scene, or a piece in the book where he actually goes and meets with Frazier, and they go on a drive in the city. I think they're driving from probably from Philly to New York, so it's a bit of a drive. And Ali actually brings a tape recorder with him, uh, which is something that he would do when he was making this autobiography. Uh, as uh, uh, one of um, Ali's biographers point out, uh, it's probable that Ali was actually illiterate. Um, his high school education is sort of suspect. He kind of was given a kind of a, a honorary almost high school diploma from his school. Uh, at this point in time, he was already a known amateur boxer, uh, and they thought that he, it'd be good to know that for people to know that Ali went to that school. Um, but uh, what was really happening with Ali's um, biography, which, like I said, we're going to talk about a little bit, is that it was ghostwritten by another writer, a lot of it. Uh, but some of them are actual direct passages where he actually just records on a tape recorder uh, so he doesn't have to write things down. And he actually records this conversation with him and Frazier. It's a really humorous uh, conversation between the two men, basically talking about how they would fight each other. And it seems like they kind of form a bond. And I think what Frazier believes at this point, and he, and he, testif he testifies this himself in his own autobiography, that he believed Ali to be his friend. Like, I think that he thought that Ali was generally interested in him and that they were friends, friendly, you know, as two, two black men in the 60s, you know, basically trying to navigate this space of celebrity and the space of the boxing world and things like this. Uh, and it gets to the point where Frazier actually ends up uh, giving Ali some money to help him financially and kind of support him. Frazier goes out on a limb and actually sp speaks in support of Ali's stance. And he says, you know, well, I don't agree with Ali's uh, political and social positions and his, his you know, you know, necessarily his religious group, the Nation of Islam. As an American, I believe that every person has the right to make their own choice and that they should be able to choose what religion they want to believe in and that if they don't want to fight in a war, they shouldn't be required. And that in and of itself was a bit um, progressive and controversial because uh, Frazier was, uh, you know, a Baptist, an outspoken sort of, you know, Christian and... Um, and, uh, you know, Ali was a sort of this controversial figure, but he put his kind of neck on the line and supported Ali's stance, even though he, he recognized it was a controversial one. Um, and um, Ali ends up moving to Philadelphia, which is where Joe Frazier's from, and actually buys a house. And it's kind of almost like this, like, bromance type thing. It's sort of like almost like single white female, where Ali kind of just starts, like, showing up all the time at wherever Joe Frazier is. And Joe Frazier's also at this point, by the way, um, he has a soul group where he, where he, he sings and... And he has, they were, I don't know, he was Joe Frazier. He was a heavyweight champion of the world. I don't know how good they were, but people would pay to see him sing. Uh, so he would travel around and, and Ali would show up at like his, his concerts and come on stage and do all these types of antics that are typical of Ali. Uh, and it starts to get on the, the nerves of Frazier because Frazier was a pretty quiet man. Um, he didn't really mind Ali kind of having the limelight because it sort of allowed him to sort of be a little bit more reserved. But things really come to a head when finally Ali is given permission to return to boxing. And of course, the first fight, uh, major fight that they want him to have is the fight against is the fight against Frazier. Uh, he does do some tomb nut fights, which is relevant because one of the things that people like to claim with Ali is, well, he'd been in exile. So, you know, that first fight, maybe he wasn't in his prime or whatever, which is an interesting argument as well. But does a couple tune up fights before he fights Frazier. But once Frazier and Ali, the official fight is on, 
Fr Ali's relationship or his his attitude toward Frazier completely changes, and he turns on Frazier, and he starts claiming that he's an Uncle Tom. He starts calling him a gorilla, and he starts doing all this kind of stuff. And this really bothers Frazier because Frazier thought they were friends, um, but it's also really putting a negative image of Frazier in the press. And it's starting to affect his family because Frazier's a family man. He's got sons. In fact, his son Marvin uh, Frazier ends up being a heavyweight fighter himself. He fights Mike Tyson uh, years later when Tyson's in his prime. Um, and his, his kids start getting bullied at school. And then he starts being kind of ridiculed by the black community. And none of this is true. Uh, um, and Ali knows that. In fact, in his autobiography, Ali's autobiography, he talks about how he actually pursued Frazier, pursued the relationship with Frazier because he wasn't a quote-unquote Uncle Tom. He was a progressive, you know, modern black man. Um, and that's why he felt like they could be friends. But once the limelight's back on, the fight's on, he changes the story. Now, to be fair, some of this, it seems, was sort of colluded by these two men's behind the scenes. That they, What Ali always knew was that um, controversy sells tickets. And how Ali kind of got into this whole thing was actually, interestingly, uh, by modeling himself after a wrestler, a professional wrestler by the name of Gorgeous George. Ali saw Gorgeous George at a wrestling match and thought it was hilarious, but ingenious. Because what he learned about Gorgeous George was, Gorgeous George, by the way, was kind of like the heel. He was like the villain in this professional wrestling circle. And he also sort of played this sort of stereotypical sort of homosexual man. That's why they call them Gorgeous George. And then he would go in and he'd get kind of beat up by these other wrestlers. And people would pay to see Gorgeous George lose because uh, he was the villain. And what Ali learned is that if you uh, love you or hate you, it doesn't matter because if people are buying tickets to your fights, you're making money. Uh, and that's the box office draw. He was an ingenious marketer. So early on in his career, Ali never uh, feigned away from or, or hid away from any type of controversy. In fact, he encouraged it. He almost promoted controversy because he thought, well, some people are going to like what I have to say and they're going to come to the fight because they want to see me win. A lot of people are going to hate what I'm going to say, but they're going to come to the fight because they want to see me lose. Either way, they're both coming to the fight. So some of this stuff with Frazier behind the scenes was probably choreographed, but it's uh, either way, um, Ali took it too far. And, and Frazier finally tried to confront Ali about it, and Ali just wasn't having it. And what Frazier basically uh, says is, which is probably correct, that he feels that Ali was, it was always just, everything was just a game to Ali. And it was always really always just about himself. And that he was always working an angle to just get attention and to sort of promote himself. And he would use anything around him to do so. And, and I think Frazier was hurt by that. And I think his family was hurt by that. And one of the things that, that Frazier points out, and again, this is just the hypocrisy of Muhammad Ali, is that Muhammad Ali was calling Frazier uh, Uncle Tom when, Uncle, when, when Joe Frazier's a, a dark-skinned black man uh, living in an urban city uh, who's being trained under Eddie Futch, who's a black trainer. Uh, and he was pretty much a loyalist to those people who brought him up at his early ages and continued to go back to his own neighborhood uh, and things like this, um, where he was from. Um, whereas Ali uh, was essentially, uh, his career started by a, a, a group of white millionaires um, who sort of like sponsor him and pay for him. And then he brings in uh, Angelo Dundee as a, a white trainer and he surrounds himself with all these sort of people in boxing that are largely white. Um, he saddles up with the white media and he forms his bond with Howard Cosell to help promote his own career. So the irony being the guy who's promoting sort of, you know, black is beautiful and that I'm a progressive black man and I'm not the, the white man's champ and I'm not, uh, I'm not an Uncle Tom is ironically the one who, if you actually look at his actual course of action, would be more susceptible to such a criticism, okay, if that makes sense, than say someone like Frazier, but that's not the way it works. And because Ali's such, at this point in time, uh, a huge icon, the black community sort of takes Ali at his word and then they start to sort of dislike Frazier and it ends up kind of hurting his career. And I don't think Frazier ever forgave Ali for that. Um, I've talked about in the Ali video how he uses a lot of white supremacist language. He, he refers to uh, Frazier as like a gorilla. Um, and he sort of race baits um, and he turns it into like a battle between him, who is the black people's champion and a black Muslim. Although, again, interestingly, Ali's light skinned and actually truthfully biracial as he had um, um, white ancestry in his, 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 his past. And Frazier is the dark skinned black man who is the tool of the white world. But the only thing that, that Frazier really did is he just held the championship belts that were not allowed to be given to Ali. Uh, when Ali was in exile, but that wasn't Frazier's fault. He had no control over the boxing commissions. He's just a boxer trying to box, but that's how it all manifests itself. 
Um, so some other interesting things about Frazier, um, he is one of the fighters that was uh, sort of an inspiration for Stallone and Rocky Balboa, uh, the Rocky movies. Um, the primary inspiration for that's another uh, fighter who probably deserves his own video, which is a guy by the name of Chuck Wepner. Um, but there's also some Rocky Marciano in there, which is where the name comes from, and of course the Italian heritage. But at least the city of Philadelphia, which is where uh, Stallone was from and sort of set as the setting of the Rocky movies, comes from Frazier. Frazier was a Philadelphia guy. Um, he, uh, when he came to the city of Philadelphia, worked initially in a meatpacking plant like Rocky Balboa, and he would hit on the meat carcasses like you see in those early films. And when he would train and do his road work, he would actually run the city and he'd run up the flight of stairs, the the, um, the museum, the art museum steps that are now iconic in that Rocky Balboa um, movie where Rocky runs up those steps. So that's actually stuff he took from real life uh, Joe Frazier. Um, so those are just a little things more, more about the city of Philadelphia more so than the actual story arc of Rocky. But certainly Frazier was an inspiration. And in fact, Stallone actually brought Frazier in at one point in time on the set of Rocky Three. I think they had actually considered casting him as Clubber Lang, um, which is later cast by Mr. T because he's a better actor, whereas Frazier was a better fighter. Um, they didn't think they probably had the acting acumen to sort of take on that role. But Frazier does come in and spar with Stallone, and it was kind of a cool moment for Sylvester Stallone, I guess, to get to meet the great Joe Frazier. But um, what's also kind of interesting about Joe Frazier um, is that everyone says positive things about him. Um, and to be fair, he wasn't a perfect man. Um, he, his wife loved him and said he was a good, loving husband and a good father. He did, although, have affairs uh, on the side. Uh, it appears, of course, at least according to biographers, that the wife was aware of these things and I guess took a passive. I don't know that she was like okay with it, but didn't seem to mind it. Um, um, but that's not to say that, you know, he was a perfect, perfect gentleman or a perfect uh, human. Um, and of course, when Ali um, starts to race bait and criticize Frazier, Frazier kind of starts to do the same thing in reverse of Ali. And, and he kind of says some things throughout the course of his career that have kind of gotten sort of negative, um, negative, uh, I don't know, perceptions about Frazier. Uh, because, uh, you know, when, when Ali started to get sick and have sort of dementia issues, you know, Frazier's like, oh, I guess I did win those fights, you know, kind of things like this. He called him Cassius Clay rather than Muhammad Ali. You wouldn't use his his um, his name that was given to him by the Nation of Islam. That's actually a whole interesting story itself um, that a lot of people don't know about that. But I'm going to save that for my video on, on Floyd Patterson because a lot of people don't really understand that that was largely manipulated by Ali himself um, and that he actually himself often referred to himself as Cassius Clay, but we'll talk about more, more of that later. So some people have used that to kind of counter that, well, Frazier wasn't you know this perfect guy either, but for the most part, people all had positive things to say about Joe Frazier. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've heard people like Mike, Mike Tyson is an interesting person because he was a student of uh, custom auto, but also boxing. And, um, you know, he talks in his, the, the documentary Tyson, if you've, if you've never watched it, it's great, um, how one of the things D'Amato taught him was how every champion had something to teach them. And, and um, I think when he gets to, you know, he's talking about, so he talks about, oh, Jack Johnson this and Joe Lewis that and Dempsey this. He says, well, when Muhammad Ali, and he said, well, well D'Amato said, Cust told me Muhammad Ali's the greatest because he was the most entertaining. And I think that that's probably one of the best summations of Ali I've ever heard. Um, but I also saw Tyson talking about um, when he got to meet Joe Frazier, it was actually on an interview with Howard Stern, because Stern brought up the, this conflict between Ali and Tyson, or excuse me, Ali and Frazier, and this sort of him, uh, Stern himself saying, well, I didn't like the way Ali handled this and the race baiting of Frazier and blah, 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 and what was it like when you met Frazier? And um, Tyson only has incredible things to say. He was the most, one of the most generous, kind-hearted people I ever met. He just was, he was so um, humble. He was just a, such a humble man. Um, and so you listen to what, what people have to say about Frazier and it's, it's usually very positive. So I'll end on, 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 uh, two interesting stories. Okay. One comes from Ali's autobiography or excuse me. Yeah. Autobiography. And one comes from, uh, Joe Frazier's biography. Okay. Written by a, a third party. Okay. Well, as we'll learn, they both were. <laughs> so if you read uh, Ali's uh, autobiography, you'll find that there's a couple stories that as you're reading them, they read like almost like bad television. 
like 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 it's like you're you're, you're, <laughs> you're reading like a, a chips episode or like a old dukes of hazard episode uh and it's basically the story of ali after he comes back from fighting the olympics and he's got his gold medal and he stops in the south of his diner and he won't get served because he's black and he's like well i'm muhammad ali and or cassius clay at this time and i just want a gold medal for our country and all i want is to just be able to sit down and eat with the people and and then the, the the cook or the owner's like no you can't you can't we don't serve your kind here you got to get out so they go to leave and when they leave the restaurant they get met by this sort of biker gang of white supremacists <laughs> and then the story just unfolds from there and they start being chased on motorcycles and they go over a bridge and there's chains involved and knives and they get in a fight and they catch the leader and his friends got the leader at got at a knife point and finally they just walk away and it's sort of this battle of the races. And as you're reading it or listening to it, if you're doing it on Audible, because it is available on Audible, uh, it comes off like so catty and, and you're just like, there's no way this is real. Well, it turns out it wasn't real. The whole thing was fake. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it was a ghostwriter and they brought this guy in and he wrote all these stories and made all this stuff up and it became uh, his autobiography. And a lot of people at that point in time didn't know it was all fiction. So, but I thought, well, that's a perfect example of Muhammad Ali, this sort of over the top, but larger than life character and a lot of it was just smoke and mirrors it was just fiction um but it was entertaining and and it is an entertaining story um and you're, it pulls you in uh even though it's not true well the other story is one that joe frazier's uh biographer writes about him uh the biography is called smoke and joe frazier uh, the author's name eludes me at the moment, so I apologize for that. But he opens by telling this story, which I, I think up till that point no one knew about. And it was just something that he came across when he was interviewing people about Joe Frazier. And it's a Joe Frazier who's older in life. He's retired from boxing. He's still obviously a known name. So he goes around and he has these obligations as sort of a sports figure where he tours and does these whatever, um, probably speaking engagements. And he's come home to his home. And he's got his car, his driver uh, is going to take him because he's got to go to this, he's got to drive somewhere, so probably into New York or something, again, like the previous story. And he's like, you know, I haven't had time to spend with my sons uh, for a while. So he asks his, his boys if they would like to travel with him so he can just kind of catch up with them and see how they're doing in life. And at this point in time, they're, they're both grown men themselves. And so like, sure, so they all hop in the car together and off to this little uh, trip. And it turns out to be a really bad, like, ice or snowstorm. And if you know that area, Philadelphia, New York, Jersey, there's a lot of bridges. And so they're having to go over this kind of tumultuous <laughs> driving scenario where they're going over this bridge and all this ice and snow. And so they're kind of moving slowly. And as they're uh, doing this, Frazier was looking out the window and he sees a man um, who's in a wheelchair and he's carrying something in his lap. And he's basically trying to wheel his wheelchair over this bridge in the middle of this ice storm. And Frazier says, driver, driver, stop the car, stop the car. And, and was there a problem? Yeah, just stop the car. So the driver pulls the car over and Frazier gets out and he's like, you know, excuse me, sir, do you, are you okay? Like, do you need help? And, and the guy's like, oh yeah, no, no, I'm just trying to, I just gotta, he's like, well, let me, let me help you. Let me, let me help you. I can see, um, you know, you're, you look like you're in trouble here. We can help you out. And he says the, the thing he's carrying in his lap is actually a can of kerosene. Uh, and the man's crippled, uh, and he's in this chair, and it's the middle of the snowstorm, and, the, and, the, and he said the man was kind of like hesitant, he said, well, do you live nearby, are you trying to get, can we take you home, and the guy's like, well, yeah, he's like, let me just help you out, so he ends up talking to the guy and persuading him to get in the car with him, and he, he, he helps assist the man in the car, he puts the wheelchair in the trunk, takes the kerosene in the trunk, and he's like, well, where do you live, and so the guy's kind of hesitant and reticent to let him know, but it ends up they go a couple blocks up the road. And what Frazier realizes is it's a, an abandoned part of the city um, where these sort of old row homes that have been deteriorated and, and left um, uh, are setting. And that essentially this man is squatting. And that was probably why he didn't want Frazier to know where he was living. He's essentially homeless. Um, um, but Frazier doesn't do anything. He just says, oh, is this where you live? Okay, no problem. Yeah, man, we'll help you out. We'll help you out. And he gets his boys to help him. They get the chair out and they grab the kerosene and they take him inside. And once they find, uh, once they get inside, they find a family uh, huddled together in the middle of the abandoned home uh, with no heat, um, basically just trying to survive and make it through this this, this storm. Um, and so this man, the crippled father in a wheelchair, had basically braved the storm to go to find kerosene to try to, to light a fire to keep his family warm. And 
Frazier sees what's going on and uh, his sons see what's going on too. And he says, well, I'm, you know, old timer, I'm glad we could help you basically. And he said, uh, let me let me give you something else. And Frazier was known for keeping a roll of money, cash, on his person at all times in his sock uh, in case a scenario like this presented it. Sorry about that, my phone shut off there. Uh, but essentially, he gives this man some money uh, so he can take care of his family. And takes his son back, sons back to the car and says, uh, see that boys, that's a man, that's a man who's just trying to take care of his family. And uh, yeah, I, th I think it's a good story uh, as an example of who Joe Frazier was. Um, and it's a story that, again, is in stark contrast to the stories we get of Muhammad Ali. And it's also interesting that it's a story that's not in Frazier's own book. I mean, these are not the stories Frazier tells about himself. These are the stories that other people tell about Frazier. Uh, and that oftentimes is, is more telling. So that's why I'm a Joe Frazier fan, and that's some interesting history about his relationship with Muhammad Ali. Thank you.